When we look at industry conditions, we also want to dig into demand conditions. Now to reconcile that with the knowledge side as well, we want to recognize why search within an in industry and what does that do for us in our likelihood of success. One, it certainly provides some insights into the attractiveness of an industry for new entrants. So we, if we understand the knowledge conditions of the industry and what's it going to take to succeed, and we understand the demand conditions, then it gives us kind of both sides of the coins to consider before we enter that given industry. What this also does is it lets us know kind of the rules of competition and what's involved with competing effectively and how we can compete given our knowledge and given demand versus what else is going on within that industry and what our competitors are doing and what assets and what risk that they're pursuing as well. And when we look at demand, we want to think about it in three different ways. One is the magnitude. What do I mean by magnitude? What's magnitude? Oh. Amount, quantity, size. We want to think about the rate of change and preferably the rate of growth. So we might have a big market, we might have a small market, but again, we're more concerned about is it growing, is it expanding? And then there's this element of heterogeneity, which is the level of similarity within that demand. And we'll talk about what that means if tied to segmentation as well. So there are dying businesses out there. There are things that I would argue are small markets and or diminishing or contracting markets. What comes to mind? What kind of business might you not want to start? Blockbuster. You might want to not start a home video rental business where you have to go to the store as a customer, check it out, and then go back to return it. Newspapers. Newspapers. Who bought a newspaper today? <laughs> One? You paid for it with your own money? None. Read the Zero. Like Who has bought a newspaper in the last month? You paid for the paper yourself. No, yeah, you paid for the paper. One. Okay. On your paper, just in the corner of your paper, write down, without conferring with your friend and without looking at what they're doing, write down what the New York Times cost. Oh, I know. Uh, Write down one, quietly, no. quietly, one day, one time, time, one of the most popular papers in the U.S. Write down what you think, yeah. one issue, one day, one time, I'm buying the New York Times from the store. What do you pay for that? Okay. Now look on your neighbor's paper. Make sure they have something. Make sure they have something. Who thinks they have something by hand? Who thinks they have something lower than anybody else in the class? <laughs> okay, what do you have? I have 50 cents. 50 cents. Anybody can beat 50 cents? I got 25. You have 25 cents. Anybody lower than 25 cents? What do you have? I mean, I said free. That's because I was thinking. So we're somewhere between free and 25 cents. Who thinks they have something that's expensive? Yeah. One dollar. One dollar. Who can beat a dollar? Two dollars. Two. Who can beat two? Three. Above three? Five. Five. Beat five. I said 15. <laughs> and you were thinking per day? Okay, so we're somewhere between a quarter, we'll cut out the outliers, we're somewhere between a quarter and five dollars. With some people thinking free to 15. What's that tell us about that market? It's not our market. We have no idea on average. Anybody know the right answer? It's two. Two. How many? Two one. 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 Two. 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 It's two something. It's Pretty sure it's a dollar. We don't know. We don't know. Not a good measure for your market when people don't even know what your product costs. When we look again, everybody, stick with me. Anybody seen a payphone lately? Okay. 
Where have you seen it? You see them on colleges. Colleges slow to change. Anybody see them beyond colleges? Kind of around cities. In cities? Like, can you tell me specifically where you've seen one? Yep. The public library. In the public library. Um, in London. In London. <laughs> Subways. In subways, few and far between. So let's move on. So again, we see a number of things that are rare and getting rarer. So what do you think is next? People mentioned the video rental. What else do you think it's going to be rare that you're not going to even know the price? Books. Printed books, perhaps. Classical music. Nope. We'll, talk about, we'll talk about the book market. <laughs> Other things. This might be like in the future more, but desktop. Desktop PCs. CDs. CDs. Again, record stores, CDs, somewhat in that same category. What, what do you mean, tapes? Like, uh, like tapes with music on them? Well, they're largely gone. <laughs> Already gone. We'll do one more. Yep. Um, watches. Watches. Are you kidding me? Who does not have a watch on now? Yeah, so in that way, a lot of people are not wearing watches. Just the majority of you. The majority of you. So what is popular? What does Inc. Magazine tell us is an industry, not so much a product, but an industry that is popular? 3D printing. 3D printing as an Industry is a bit narrow. I'd say that's more of a product line. Yep. Web and website, online, okay. Smartphones, bio. What's common about all of these? They're all technology-based. So, again, mobile. Why is education and specifically exam-based prep and tutoring very popular? It's getting more competitive. It's a big market, a growing market. And people continue to invest in education when even other things are expensive for them. What do we mean by home health care? It's a nurse or just another trained professional that might not have the credentials that a nurse has, but might be capable of going into homes and providing some level of in-home care and assistance. We've talked about beverages, safety, always an issue, always a concern, security, always an issue, always a concern. So again, a couple of things are tech-based, a couple of them are education-based, a couple of them are in this area of health and safety and wellness. So when we look at where are venture capitalists putting their money, uh, this is from a VC firm here in the D.C. area called Novak Biddle, and they do communications, consumer and Internet, education, security services, and software. So they do a variety of different things. They don't do health care in a big way. They don't do energy in a big way. So venture capitalists oftentimes will kind of specialize in what we're going to do and what we're not going to do. For these three in education, particularly for those of up front or you can even spin around in the back, what strikes you about these descriptions of these companies beyond them being just in the education space? What do you find about the demand as they are describing their company? What's common among the three? Well, I just saw the technology, like, online. What's common amongst the three? <clears throat> it's not your average education. I mean, like, most people, one of them's, like, in India. Okay. One is focused on the third one, educational initiatives and assessment products in India. So India, big market. Again, they are very specific of the profile and the geography that they're targeting. What about the others? Sounds 
link to special needs in private school? Okay. So with the second one, they are looking at private schools with an autism and special needs orientation. What about the first one? What are they doing? Universities and um, the ability to teach online. And they are looking at universities and courses and curriculum in online delivery and management. What's that tell us about the industries that they're operating within or the demand that they're focusing on? Are they trying to do online for everybody? Are they trying to do uh, assessment for everybody? No, they're trying to do specialized learning. They're trying to do things that are specific. And that's what we see in a lot of companies that do well, is they're focusing on a specific need, a specific issue, what we'll call a segment, in the context of not trying to be everything to everybody, they're focusing on doing one thing and doing one thing well. Why do we like that as investors? Well, there's a market for it. Because they've defined a market that's addressable and specific and probably unmet. What else do we like about people having a specific goal? How many people to compete with? Because the competition to do what they do the way they do it is narrow. <clears throat> And so in that way, again, we'll talk about when you look at demand, how do you identify and tackle a specific issue rather than trying to serve everybody. And so what we mean by that is segmentation and that we want to think about how do we identify within an industry what we can do and where we can make an impact and where can we compete effectively and carve out a niche for ourselves there. So in that way, it's an element of thinking about what's a market that's big enough for us where we can build the company that we want to build and reach the goals that we want to have, but yet small enough that we can be specialized, that we can be known for doing what we do, and that we're going to be so good at serving our specific market that it's going to be very difficult for other people to compete with that. So when we think about why segment helps to determine who you're going to serve, more importantly, it helps to determine who you're not going to serve in the context of things that, again, might be too expensive to serve everyone, might be too time-consuming to serve everyone, and it might just be ineffective. People want different things for different purposes. And so by that measure, when you think about segmentation, it should help you go through and figure out who I want to serve in what order. So again, with these athletic products, you may want to serve the professional players. You may want to serve the college players. You may want to serve a high school market. And the right answer in the end is that you may serve them all. What's the problem of trying to serve them all at the same time? The needs, the wants, the demands, the price points, the features, the functions for each may differ a bit. You might need a different version of your product for each one. What else is the problem of trying to do them all at the same time? We want to serve them all from the beginning. What's that take? Money. Money. And particularly if it is more money than you have, you raise money from investors. Investors may give you money. You may need a million dollars. They may give you $900,000. Why do, what do they get for that $900,000 investment? Take in the company. They get a, a share of your company. How much do they get? Depends. Depends on what you negotiate for. But before you've sold a product, before you've had a customer, before you've generated a dollar in revenue, before you've manufactured anything, how much risk is there ahead of you? Uh, Tremendous amount. So if they're going to give you 90% of the money you need, how much of the company may they want? 90%. They may want 90%. They may want 
the majority of the firm. Because you have an idea, but you haven't done anything with it yet. But if, however, you are able to bring a product to market, you're serving the high school market, you've got a couple of products out, you're generating some revenue, maybe not as much as you aspire to one day, but by the time you've released a product, you've sold some customers, you've generated some revenue, you've proven the model a bit, that should have done what to your risk going forward? Should have lessened it. You've proven that some people want it, that you can produce it, and that you can make some things happen. So for that same amount of money, should they want more ownership or less ownership? If you've lowered the risk, what should they want? Less. Less. Why should they want less of your company? Because you've lowered the risk. If we invest in IBM, if we invest in Coca-Cola, is that a high-risk investment if we buy that stock? No. Very low risk. So what should we respect about our return? Should be low as well. If we're investing in startups, high risk or low risk? High risk. So we should expect what kind of returns? High returns. So if we're trying to get money from investors, if we can lower their risk by having some incremental success, by having some modest success, it should lower the amount of return that they should expect. So determining what we're going to do in what order is important, and that helps us have some success and then go forward to attack these later markets. And also when we recognize what's important to different markets and segments, we can tailor our message, we can tailor our marketing for them. And you'll see that when you look at different advertisements, when you see different ads in magazines, papers, television, you should be able to get a sense of who it is they're targeting. When you see the, uh, the Microsoft ads where the girls are breakdancing and snapping the tops off of the surface and things like that, and it's got a trendy beat to it, who are they targeting? You all. Young people. Young people. When BlackBerry does their ads and they're showing how the buttons are easy to press and you can type your messages, <laughs> who are they targeting? Yeah. Businessmen. Old men, <laughs> old people, old men and women that like BlackBerry that want to press the button, that find the screen awkward to type on. So again, pay attention to the different ads and you can see who they're marketing to, who they think their market is. Uh, what you found too, the uh, the Honda Element. Yeah. People know the Honda Element. It's a green car. Very boxy vehicle. So this is the Honda Element. Who do you think this was designed for? Who was it designed for? City. Inexpensive, I think it's high teens, maybe low 20s, but inexpensive in its category. Who was it targeted to? Teenagers. Teenagers. Young people. What? Young people. Well, what was your comment? What was your comment? No one person. You only know one person that has one. Yeah. Like in the entire lot at my school, I've only ever seen one. Only ever seen one at my school. Who buys these? Parents. Soccer mom. <laughs> Why do they buy it? A lot of space. A lot of space. The floorboards are plastic. You can rinse this thing out with a garden hose. What? Really? There are removable seats and so forth, so your storage capacity is immense. It's plastic. So easy to maintain, easy to clean affordable, big capacity, big storage capacity. And moms think that it looks kind of edgy. <laughs> Kids think that it looks kind of ugly. So sometimes even when things are designed for one market, sometimes they hit, sometimes they don't, sometimes a different market buys them. But the orientation is that 
at least you have a target in mind and you know who you want to sell to and how you want to sell and understand how to market to them effectively based on the angle that you're going for and what influences their buying decision. What we see too is that there are adopter categories, particularly as related to the adoption of technology-based products that people tend to align with when you look at how new products are released. When the iPhone was initially released, iPhone 1, what was the price point? It was like 600 $5.99. The iPhone 1, $5.99. And as they subsequently released, 2, 3, 4, 4S, 5. Is there a 5S now? It's coming soon. So as those, have those as the release of those subsequent products have come along, what happens to the pricing? What's Apple tend to do? The current product price drops, and the new product kind of comes out at the price that the old product came out at. So we may have this 599, 499 iPhone, and for every one that comes out, it maintains that price, but then the old models get progressively cheaper so that you can get your iPhone for free or $100 or whatnot now if you get an earlier version. And or, again, with the data plans and everything else, if you sign up, it's subsidized. But we see people that are in this innovator lot that are willing to pay that. Some people have the iPhone 4. And when the iPhone 5 is available, they stand in line at the store for it. I don't get that. For something that's a half ounce lighter. <laughs> for something that gives you a, is it a fourth row? Yeah. That gives you a, I'm trying to see how many rows. Is it a fifth row? So I want a fifth row of icons rather than just four rows of icons. And it's so worth it. <laughs> And if you are an innovator, you might have all the iPhones, and you might have all the Nanos, and you might have all the iPods, because you bought these things as they became available. Because you are accepting that version one is not going to be perfect, and it's going to have some glitches and some bugs and whatnot, but you're okay with that, that you have some money, not necessarily that you are rich, but that you have enough disposable income for that category to be an early adopter, or in this sense, an innovator. And as we work through these, we recognize that there are trends or commonalities amongst these groups. Some people are going to wait until all their friends have iPhones before they're going to buy one. Some people are going to wait until everybody they know has an electric car before they're going to buy one. Why do you wait? What's the advantage of waiting? Um, you can see how, like, say, the car performs. Okay. You can see how products perform, what people say about it, what they like, what they don't like. Price reduction. It gets cheaper over time. So in that way, if you're still waiting to buy a DVD player, you didn't want to pay $1,000 for one 10 years ago, You'll pay 40 bucks for one now. That's so sad. Yep. Go ahead. They can update the product. You allow versioning and improvements to happen. There are a lot of people that won't buy the first generation of a new car because they think that, well, they're going to find faults and breaks and recalls. So I want to wait until at least the second model year for all of the initial things to get repaired. Um, depending on how long you wait, there might be new competitors that come up with there might be new competitors and new options and similar products that are cheaper, faster, better. Some people that will, and that group we would call kind of the late majority. They're going to wait for things to emerge and happen. Laggards may never buy. I will never buy a cell phone because I don't think it's that important. People can find me when they want to find me, and I don't want to be found. <laughs> so in that way, again, leave a message on my answering machine at home, and I will return your call. 
How much money should Verizon spend in their marketing to convince that person to buy an iPhone? None. And I would argue that the answer is it's not, not a lot, that the answer is zero. There are some people that just aren't going to buy your product, and that's fine. You have the other 84% of the market that you can focus on, which is a lot of people, typically. So in that way, again, you do have those laggard groups, um, but I think smart companies don't spend a lot of time trying to capture them. I remember I, when I was like, I don't know, I was six years old, my grandparents bought the first portable DVD player. It was like $1,500 at the time. Okay. <laughs> actually didn't work that well because it would have a lot of problems. It was like the first of its generation, so I just remember like having a lot of problems. With it. Yeah, there are problems that come with, uh, I remember there was a individual I worked with that when he bought a laptop that would play DVDs, I think he bought it, I don't know, that day, the day before we went uh, to a meeting in New York. We were on Amtrak, and he had rented or bought Gladiator. Yeah. Give you a sense of time. So we're watching Gladiator on his laptop in Amtrak going to New York, and there are people like fan around us because <laughs> they'd never seen a laptop that could play a movie. Not that long ago. Not that long ago. So in that way, again, we see these curves emerge, and we want to recognize, well, how do you segment? Because you want to spend your time initially trying to sell to the innovators and the early adopters. You don't want to spend your time marketing to the people that are going to be tough to sell to. You want to find the people that want it, that buy it. When they have the first glimpse of what it is that you can offer, they want it. And so in that way, one way to segment is based on wants and needs. Are you helping them save money? Are you helping them make money? Are they going to be more productive? Can they produce with better quality? Can they deliver with greater service? So these are the types of things that you may, when thinking about an industry, be able to make some impacts. People know the Square device, what Square is. What Square? It's uh, something that you can plug into your iPhone or iPad, and uh, it basically just Swipe your credit card through it. Okay. It's something that's about the size of a dice, maybe two dice, but it's a small dongle. You plug it into your iPhone, you plug it into your tablet, and it has a credit card swipe feature on it. What's it cost? Free. Free. How do they make money? Yeah. All the transaction percentages. So in that way, again, an easy way for retailers or even individuals to accept credit card payments. In essence, it may help them save money versus buying a register. It may help them make money and that they could accept credit cards, whereas before maybe they couldn't or it was cumbersome to do so. And they're serving, again, retailers. So big market opportunity, but again, changing some of those dynamics. You also have the opportunity when you think about needs and wants, so what do people have interest in? And they might have interest in education. They might have interest in the environment. They might have interest in security. And you see a wave of home security markets that are wireless, that are selling with some success. What's the value of a wireless home security system versus a wired system? Um, so the thieves can't cut the wires to prevent the... Okay. So you can't cut the wire. So, you know, if you really have something in your house that a professional is coming after and they know how to cut wires, then maybe you can bypass that. What do you think is a more tangible and more common benefit of installing a wireless system? It's like much easier to set up because you don't have to like wire it through your whole entire house. You don't have to wire it through your house. So I only know this because of when we bought uh, blinds. We have 38 windows in my house. It's a decent sized house, but it's not a it's not a mansion by any means. But when you begin thinking about your house, in a room you may have three windows. It's not a lot of windows. And if you're in a corner, you might have a couple of windows on this side, a couple on that side. So 
you probably have more windows than you think you have when you really go through and add up not a wall of windows, but again, there might be two that are side by side if it's a wider room. You go through, you add them up, a lot of windows. Now, even with a wireless solution, I need to have a switch on each window to indicate that it's open. But to get wires in, out comes the saw, out comes the crowbar, and you're taking down sheetrock and repainting to install a wired solution. So far and away, the labor of doing it is going to be dramatically more expensive than the hardware itself. And you've torn your house apart in the process. What do you think it takes to install a wired switch on a window? Oh, I'm sorry, a wireless switch. Uh, I'm just putting it, uh put it on the window and probably link it up wirelessly. It's like tape. It's like I'm going to take a piece of tape and stick it there and I'm good to go. <laughs> and I do a little software or something or another, it syncs it up and I'm in business. So in that way, why don't we see more of these? Expensive. They're expensive versus a wired solution. Easier. There's some element of, again, is it easy to bypass, hack, jam, etc.? It's pretty new to the market, so people don't want to jump right into it. It's new. We're not exactly sure. Does it work? You know, my cell phone gets spotty coverage when it gets cloudy, so is my security system going to go out? And what happens if I lose power? Do these things operate on battery? Am I going to have to change the battery 38 times every month? So there are a lot of unknowns about it. What else do we, why do we buy such a system? Safety. So it's kind of not the type of thing where I'm going to buy a different flavor of coffee and if I don't like it, toss it. It's a, if I buy it and it doesn't work, then my safety has been compromised and that's a big deal. So in that way, again, you find that when you look at these needs and wants, you have to understand what are the pros, what are the cons, even if the feature and the function sounds better. There's an element of do people buy into it, do people value it, and are they going to take that risk if you're doing something truly innovative? Confused. Are we talking about like if I went to the store and bought a security system and came back and did it myself, or I hired a security company? To do Either. I'm talking about is this something, and that's a question of who's your market and what's your sales channel, of if we were the developer of such a product, would we sell it on the shelf at Best Buy as a home install? or at Lowe's, or is this something we would try and sell through security companies for them to install? I would argue selling it through security companies for them to install is going to be a tough sale. Why is that the case? They're going to want to do more labor. Because they lose the money on the labor they may have otherwise gotten. new technology, a lot of things could go wrong, and then the companies would be accountable for it. Okay. They know the current technology works. You're asking them to bear the liability on something that's unproven that you've developed that they're going to not make as much money on. So a difficult sale, so it's probably going to be to an end consumer. But you want to think about all of these elements of needs and wants, and why would people say yes or no? Other ways to think about how do I segment a market could be based on geography. And again, this is largely what a lot of franchises are based on. McDonald's will not sell you a McDonald's beside another McDonald's <laughs> because they have segmented their market by geography and that you may have the rights to a certain population centered around a certain location. People also segment by age. There's a cell phone called the Jitterbug that's geared towards elderly folks. People seen the jitterbug? Yeah. Yep. What is it? It's like a really, it's like a flip phone. It has a really okay, it's a clamshell design, so the flip phone. The numbers are like really big. The, there, are no touch screen. So no touch screen, it's buttons, big buttons with big numbers on them. Well, let's say the dealer is, but the Galaxy S4 has a function that's pretty similar to that. Okay. That's not how that's doing. 
I do not, but I would argue that if you're targeting a elderly person, they have no need for a Galaxy S4. Has a, like a symbol function, like it becomes a But I'm not going to pay a premium with a data plan that I'm not going to use, <laughs> even if it has a feature to take away all its features. <laughs> Part of the benefit of the jitterbug is that all it really does is just call people. It's a phone that calls people. That's all novel, about. novel concept. <laughs> and in some of its other competitors, there's the jitterbug targeted at that population. Again, we're kind of stereotyping that older generation. I work with some folks at the university that are in their 70s with iPhones. So it's not everybody, but there's some that want something simple, functional, visual. There's also the opposite end of that, of phones that are geared towards what I would call babies, three and four year olds. Really? You seen such things? Firefly. Firefly is the main competitor in that space. I used to have one of those. You have one now? No. Okay. What was the Firefly? It was a phone about this big. Okay. It was like a like an oval. And okay. You your dad and your mom and yep. 911. That's it. Yep. So it was a three button phone. You changed the colors on it too. Nice. <laughs> so the Firefly was a three button phone for kids. That's crazy. And you had programmable buttons. So there was a button with a man and a button with a woman. Yep. And 911. And 911. So 911, you might not have been able to program, but you had two buttons, and you could program them to dial whatever number you wanted, and that was it. No internet, no email, no text, no chat, no call my friend, unless my friend is one of the two numbers that my parent programmed in, and they've been around for a while. Oh yeah, you can you could receive calls. Yeah. Yeah. So you give your friends your number, and then they can call you, but you just can't call them. No. <laughs> and also with the jitterbug, there's an operator feature. What happens when you press the operator button? A person answers. And again, we're switching gears. Firefly is one thing. Jitterbug, for the elderly folks, had the operator button. Operator would answer. You could say, call Sam. What would they do? They knew who Sam was because you set up a little profile and they could patch you through to Sam. That's like a lot of labor. There's a level of labor, but it's a different market for a different purpose. And in that way, again, it's what they wanted to do when they segmented to a certain group. And so in that way, again, all of these things can come at different levels. Um, you know, based on interest. In summary, when we think about the industries, we certainly would encourage you to seek opportunities where the market demand is sufficiently large and growing. And the word sufficient is important to recognize. You don't necessarily need to pursue the biggest ideas out there, the biggest markets. There are likely big competitors that are already pursuing that. But what we mean by sufficient is based on your resources, based on your interest, and based on your goals for your venture, that you can reach those goals given the industry that you're operating within and given the market size now and where you think it's going to be going in the timeline that you'll be operating your venture in the future. The second thing to emphasize when you look at industries and markets is this element of picking a niche opportunity, of looking at a subset of that market that you can invest your time and your resources and your know-how in pursuing. And so by pursuing a very specific and niche audience within your demand, you can build your reputation, you can leverage your marketing dollars very effectively, and you can serve the needs of that specific audience very well, and perhaps even bigger than competitors.